The Empire State Building is one of the most recognizable and iconic skyscrapers of the many that make up the legendary skyline of New York City. Construction of the iconic building began in January of 1930, after years of planning had seen the scale of the building balloon from a modest 25-story office building to a towering 102-story, 1,454-foot skyscraper that would make it the tallest building in the world at the time. The Art Deco-style skyscraper's construction began just after the 1929 Wall Street crash that signaled the onset of the Great Depression. But despite this, construction of the Empire State Building proceeded as planned. A marvel of early 20th century construction, a crew of approximately 3,500 men worked tirelessly, often in extremely hazardous working conditions, and unrestrained hundreds of feet above the ground, to construct the building as expeditiously as possible. And by September 19, 1930, the steel structure of the skyscraper was fully completed, topping out at a height of 1,048 feet tall. The Empire State Building's crowning and the iconic spire atop the building were completed on November 21st later that year. The spire was designed and originally intended to serve as a mooring mast for airships. However, aside from during construction, the airship mooring mast and dock never saw any use before the 1937 Hindenburg disaster in Manchester Township, New Jersey that spelled an end for airship travel as a whole. Regardless, the addition of the spire also brought the building to a height greater than the nearby Chrysler buildings, a point of emphasis throughout the planning of the Empire State Building, and it is speculated this may have been one of the true key motivations behind the addition of the airship mooring mast. Interior work on the building was completed throughout the following few months, and on May 1st, 1931, the Empire State Building was officially opened, with a celebratory luncheon that was attended by 350 people, although reports from attendees of the luncheon noted that views from the skyscraper were obscured by a thick fog. The building would then open to the public the following day, and with its opening, it also became the tallest building in the world, a title it would hold until 1970 upon the completion of the first of the World Trade Centers. On the morning of Saturday, July 28, 1945, a B-25 Mitchell bomber plane departed from the Bedford Army Airfield in Bedford, Massachusetts for a short, routine flight to Newark Metropolitan Airport in Newark, New Jersey. Three people were aboard the B-25 on the flight bound for Newark that morning, with Lieutenant William F. Smith Jr. serving as the chief pilot for the flight, and Staff Sergeant Christopher Dimitrovich serving as the co-pilot for the flight. Also aboard the aircraft was Navy's aviation machinist mate Albert Perna, who was hitching a ride to Newark and was not involved in the in-flight operations that morning. As the B-25 approached New York City at approximately 9.35 a.m. that morning, William Smith made radio contact with Newark Airport, asking for clearance to land. Newark informed Smith of the zero visibility conditions that were caused by a dense fog that had enveloped New York City and Newark. Despite this warning, Smith decided not to abort his intended landing and proceeded to enter the layer of dense, zero-visibility fog that enveloped New York City. However, upon entering the layer of fog, Smith and Dimitrovich became disoriented and turned the plane into a right turn as they approached and passed by the Chrysler building. However, the approach that the B-25 had been taking required them to turn the plane left at the point that they instead turned it right, and this mistake would prove to be a disastrous one. At 9.40 a.m., the B-25 slammed into the north side of the Empire State Building at over 200 miles per hour, creating a hole in the skyscraper that was 18 foot by 20 foot wide and spanned across three floors stretching from the 78th to 80th floors of the building. After colliding with the building, the plane shattered into several large pieces, 
with one of the bomber's engines careening through the building and bursting out the south side of the building, traveling a further city block as it plummeted 900 feet, crashing through the roof of a nearby building where it burst into flames, destroying the penthouse art studio that had been unfortunate enough to be in its path in the process. The aircraft's other engine, along with the plane's landing gear, were hurtled into the building's elevator shafts, which caused a fire in the elevator shaft the engine had plummeted to the bottom of. The remaining fuselage was covered in leaking fuel and also quickly caught fire. Emergency personnel rushed to the scene of the disaster and quickly began operations to contain the spread of the flames and to evacuate survivors within the building as there was between 50 and 60 sightseers on the building's 86th floor observation deck at the time of the collision. Fortunately, firefighters were able to contain the blazes by 10.20 a.m., just 40 minutes after the collision, and first aid personnel worked alongside them to successfully evacuate a majority of the people trapped in the building. Notably, one survivor, an elevator operator, who was in the elevator on the 80th floor at the time of impact, named Betty Lou Oliver, was injured when she was thrown from her elevator during the plane's collision and was assisted by emergency personnel down to the 75th floor and loaded aboard another elevator for further evacuation. However, unbeknownst to them at the time, this elevator had also been damaged in the collision and not long after boarding the elevator, the cable snapped sending Betty Lou Oliver plummeting 75 stories trapped in the elevator, where it came to an abrupt halt as it crashed into the building's basement. Remarkably though, Betty Lou Oliver miraculously managed to survive her terrifying ordeal in the elevator and was evacuated from the rubble with a broken neck, back, and pelvis, but with her life intact. Her fateful fall still holds the world record for the highest survived elevator freefall to this day. In total, 11 people from inside the Empire State Building and the three men aboard the B-25 were ultimately killed in the incident. In the immediate aftermath of the incident, firefighters and cleanup crews immediately set to work clearing away the rubble caused by the collision, separating the shards of the aircraft from the pieces of the damaged building. These crews worked diligently throughout the following days, and on Monday, July 30th, the building, which was still deemed to be structurally sound, was reopened to the public for business as usual. However, it was also on July 30th that cleanup crews found the body of Albert Perna at the bottom of an elevator shaft as he had been launched into the elevator shaft from the bomber as the plane collided with the building and tumbled to the bottom of the shaft. It was further reported that three other people within the building had suffered a similar fate to Perna, as witnesses reported to local media outlets that they had witnessed rescue crews remove three badly mangled bodies from the bottom of the elevator shafts earlier on the 28th. William F. Smith Jr. and Christopher Dimitrovich's bodies were found not far from the main fuselage wreckage, but their bodies had been badly burned beyond recognition, and thus the medical examiners were unable to tell which man was whom. In the aftermath of the well-publicized disaster, there was enormous public outcry about the accident and the tragic loss of life that had occurred as a result. This public outrage ultimately resulted in the signing of the Federal Tort Claims Act in 1946, which made the government liable, quote, in the same manner and to the same extent as a private individual under like circumstances, but not liable for interest prior to judgment or for punitive damages, it states. This act allowed people impacted by the disaster to sue the United States government for damages incurred involving the government and set the precedent for liability for further incidents in the future, such as the $240 million lawsuit filed by Ludovic Michaud against the government for the horrific incident in Arches National Park from my video about the topic a few weeks back. Preceding the Empire State Building collision and the subsequent passing of the Federal Tort Claims Act, 
The government had claimed sovereign immunity from lawsuits by its citizens. In the weeks and months following the collision, the damage to the building was repaired and the affected floors were reopened. However, four days before the one-year anniversary of the crash, on July 24, 1946, Another aircraft narrowly avoided repeating the previous year's disaster as it narrowly avoided colliding with the building, so narrowly in fact, that it reportedly scraped against the observation deck on the 68th floor, badly startling the sightseers and workers inside at the time. The offending aircraft in this incident was described as a twin-engine plane bearing no military insignias. Who exactly was piloting this twin-engine plane that day? remains a mystery. Thank you all for watching.